Welcome to Garner's Greek Mythology. This is Patrick Garner. I'm a mythologist and the author of three novels. They constitute a trilogy and have one theme. That is, that the ancient Greek gods are here now and that they never left. Join me as we walk with them on a unique journey. What has been lost in the modern interpretation of so-called mythology will come to life again. Like my books, Garner's Greek Mythology podcast looks at the ancient gods assuming they are alive among us. For just a moment, I want you to suspend your disbelief. Imagine with me that they were never myths. Imagine them wandering among us. Imagine the beautiful Aphrodite. She's the goddess we commonly know as Venus, passing you as she leaves a restaurant. You know, you're certain, you're floored. You've seen her face, suddenly you're sure. You're swept with a crazy certainty. And a friend who is with you turns and says, Oh my God, that was Venus, wasn't it? Slyly, you correct her saying, No, not Venus. That was Aphrodite. (laughs) Or imagine bumping shoulders with, say, the sea god Poseidon. Poseidon? Who today could imagine him alive? A a sea god? Yet, as you sip a cold drink at a restaurant overlooking a Hawaiian beach, you see a tall, muscular man dismount his longboard. He's just finished riding a 40-foot wave and holds a bronze trident in his hand. Behind him, three dolphins leap into the air doing crazy somersaults. A waitress casually mentions, Oh, that's Poseidon, you know, that Greek divinity. He looks pretty good for an old god. Our beach is one of his favorites. If you can see these divinities as clearly as I do, then you too know these gods as something other than mythological. I know you hear my invitation and it's difficult not to be skeptical, but try this. For a moment, envision the gods as wily survivors. You probably remember a smattering of mythology. The usual school lessons go like this. The Greek gods reigned supreme until the coming of Christianity. Then they were turned out to pasture. That probably sounds familiar. Imagine that rather than being characters in quaint fairy tales, the gods were real beings. At some point, things clearly turned sour for them, and they scrambled to survive. But they did. I assure you, they did. Imagine that they were the real thing, and that they reoriented themselves. They changed their mission, and they, well, they they carried on. They don't look like characters out of Clash of the Titans, however cool that might be. They'd stand out like sore thumbs. Instead, the gods today look just like you and me, except they're perfect versions of us. Of course they are. They're gods. They're never sick. They have powers which they use judiciously. But the big thing is that they never age. Okay, let's circle back to how these ancient gods could have lived so long. Well, first, they're gods. Living endlessly is what goes with the territory. Gods tend to live on and on unless caught in some catastrophic event that snips the thread of their life. So what would constitute such a dire event? One example would be if one of the gods crossed Zeus, the greatest of the Olympic gods, You've heard his name. Even today, everyone knows it. Let's review his biography. The mighty Zeus, the god of thunder. He lorded it over all. He terrified the world. The other gods resented him, but trembled in his presence. He was infamous for throwing lightning bolts at the slightest provocation. But as much as I've tried to convince you that these gods walk among us, I have to confess that Zeus, of the many divinities, alas, is no more. You see, he eventually crossed someone even greater than himself. It's funny how even the mightiest 
seemed to eventually meet up with someone or something mightier. What happened? We'll devote a future episode to Zeus's exploits and unfortunate demise. Now, before we go further with this Greek god theme, we should set the stage. So far, we've walked out of a restaurant and encountered Aphrodite. We've been sipping a cold one beside a beach in Hawaii and watched Poseidon emerge from the waves. Those encounters were here, in our time. But to understand these gods far better, we need to step back and step into our time machine. Look, <laughs> there it is. Let's travel back to ancient Greece. Ah, uh, we're here, just on the outskirts of Athens. Behind us are fields dotted with olive trees. And before us are the walls of Greece's largest city. There's an open gate. Let's go through it. It's hard for us to imagine today what the Greeks of Homer, Socrates, Plato, and Aristotle believed. But now we've zipped back 2,500 years. By our calendar, it's about 500 B.C. As we enter the city, we encounter some of the most intelligent yet superstitious humans who ever lived. In Athens, in the most sophisticated city in Greece, almost everyone believed that trees were possessed by spirits. The rivers had river gods that naiads, young women somewhat equivalent to our mermaids, watched over waterways. The sun's ascent and descent to a sun god named Helios, whose stallions pulled his chariot with its glowing fireball day after day across the heavens. Now let's try to get into the minds of these Greeks these ancient Greeks, what do they believe? To us today, their religion is full of contradictions. By the way, the Greeks had no word for religion. Their closest term was Eusebia, which roughly translates as pity. What? You say an entire culture without the word religion? It's hard to imagine. But look at it like this. They didn't need a term because... For the Greeks, religion was as natural as breathing or blinking or laughing. Everyone believed the same thing. The gods were everywhere and responsible for everything. Why have a word for what was so innate? But I'm easily sidetracked. A moment ago, we were listing famous gods. Let's get back to it. You've probably heard of Artemis. I find it fascinating that the new NASA moon project is named for her. Two, one, zero, zero, and lift off. Lift NASA off. says American Artemis will carry the first woman astronaut to the moon. But before NASA got its hands on her, she was a virgin goddess who protected young girls and wild animals. While protecting wild animals, she simultaneously hunted them with a bow, like every day. Killing them with her arrows was one of her great pleasures, sort of like a, a life pursuit. It isn't logical, but then the gods are rarely logical. And are there more examples? Really, they're endless. Here's another one. Throughout Greece, there were nymphs. These are young girls related to the naiads. I mentioned naiads earlier, the, the nymphs that were lovely and might be found in every forest in spring. Some were infamous for luring young men into, how shall I put this, into dubious rendezvous. Here's another example. The goddess Athena was one of Zeus's many daughters. She was unique in that at her birth, she sprung fully grown and fully armored from Zeus's head, bright sword in hand, bypassing all the traumas of childhood. By the way, the city of Athens took Athena's name, and she in turn protected it. Well, at least sometimes she did. In reality, Athens succumbed to sieges and plague and invasions. Yet, even after these disasters, Athenians believed in Athena. What else? In those days, Greeks thought the span of each human's life was predetermined by the fates. Sort of like our thoughts about predestination. The fates were three heartless virgins, all with strange names, at least to us. Lachesis, Clotho, and Asa. 
It was believed that at birth, Lachesis decided a person's lifespan, while Clotho measured a thread representing the length of that life. And then, after the years that spun by, Asa cut it with her scissors. Sure, it was heartless, but it was fate. Another character was Ares. In Hollywood movies, he seems to always play the evil madman, the, the crazed warrior. I've always thought of Ares as the original James Bond bad guy, you know, Dr. No or Goldfinger. Any of those guys except on steroids. Wars were whipped up by Ares. He was the angry god of war hovering over every battlefield with his burning eyes. Homer wrote that Ares had a terrible shriek that, when heard during battle, could cause the bravest of men to fall on their knees. Ares was, at least briefly, Aphrodite's lover, which would have made a strange twosome. Just imagine beauty and bloodlust, sort of like Beauty and the Beast, only far worse. And Aphrodite, whom the Romans renamed Venus, was the goddess of love. As such, no woman could compete with her beauty and sensuality. Soon, we'll devote an entire episode in her honor as well. There were other gods. I think particularly of Dionysus, one of my favorites. He was the god of theater, wine, and dance. He loved to party and went from town to town holding moonlit dances for the local girls. The Romans called him Bacchus. When you think of him, think of grapes and bottomless wine glasses. He was into drunken dances and ecstasy. The local village girls began to follow him from dance to dance. I mean, who wouldn't have? This guy was all about fun. These girls were like our groupies. I can imagine them always screaming his name. And in some ways, Dionysus was a very modern character. He was never completely accepted by the other gods. But it's time we jump back to ancient Athens, Greece's most famous city. Here we go. We've passed through his gate. We're back wandering its narrow streets. Just imagine... Homes are jammed together. Women are rarely seen as they're confined to women's quarters, always well off the street. It's genuinely a man's world. The doorways to each home are decorated with what are called sacred herms. These are stone pillars with the carved head of Hermes. These strange markers beside every door are intended to ward off wandering evil spirits. And who do we encounter on the streets? Certainly not evil spirits, but instead craftsmen and merchants, free men. Although some are slaves running errands. In fact, they outnumbered the actual citizens of Greece. It's important to know that until the last 100 to 150 years, slaves were found in every country. England, France, Spain, Italy, Egypt, China, America, and most of the African countries. And sure, we find the concept shocking today. Yet not too many years ago, it was just the way it was. The Greeks were certainly no exception. Even the great philosopher Plato thought slavery a natural condition. You were free or you were a slave. I mentioned earlier that the Greeks had no word for religion. Ironically, they were so religious that they didn't need such a word. For instance, inside every Athenian's home was an altar with figurines of the gods they favored. Beside a statue of Artemis might be found one of Athena, but these examples, this religiosity, were not just found in homes. There were hundreds of public altars at temples scattered throughout the city. At these communal places of worship, Citizens would sacrifice birds, sheep, and even on special occasions, bulls. More frequently, they would make offerings of bread and fruit, coins and other valuables. Sacrifices, of course, were meant to influence and persuade the gods. You see, throughout the Mediterranean, sacrifices were the ancient equivalent of prayers. And how did sacrifice influence the gods? It was commonly believed that the gods thrived on the, the smoke from the altars. The smoke was like a stimulant. In other words, the gods flourished on the sacrificial vapors. If their supplicants neglected to thank the gods, 
they knew they could be punished in countless ways, and no one took that risk. And so the people who had no word for religion were perhaps the most religious people who have lived. I mentioned earlier that they were also wildly superstitious. Let me explain further. Most Greeks imagined spirits in every dark alley, magical beings in every waterway, goddesses in every sacred grove. Stones, even stones, were imbued with intelligence. And the stars in the sky, they were merely heroic beings from the past whom the divinities had cast into the night to forever honor the brave and even the beautiful. And earthquakes... They were indications of some god's fury, not the movement of tectonic plates. It's probably becoming obvious to you that for the Greeks, the world was a swirl with gods and demigods, unseen spirits and strange beings, specters like hidden birds watched and judged each person's actions. And unsurprisingly, in this oddly mystical world, the Olympic gods prospered. It is those gods we'll focus on during the coming episodes. We'll meet what I call the A-gods. Who are they? Athena, Artemis, Apollo, Aphrodite, and Ares. We'll also excavate from the sands of mythology the equally notable H-gods. Hestia, Hermes, Hecate, Helios, Hades, Hera, and Hephaestus. We'll shine light on Gaia, the greatest of all goddesses, and we'll discuss Zeus, Dionysus, and the Fates. All of them, in their immortality and ingenuity, influenced the Greeks. What's cool, though, is that even today, in the 21st century, we know many of their names. We'll focus in Episode 2 on what happened to the gods and why they seemingly disappeared by the 5th century of our current era. Why did the Greek gods retreat from a world that seemed so dependent on their blessings? Did the Greeks suddenly shake off their old superstitions? Or did another force more powerful than the old religion sweep the world? I invite you to join us for the next episode of Garner's Greek Mythology. This is Patrick Garner, and thanks for listening. New episodes will appear every couple of weeks, that is, if the gods are willing. Special musical thanks to my talented nephew, Mark Garner, with Saraz Handpants, who has graciously gifted us with several of the background pieces in this episode. Be sure to visit patrickgarnerbooks.com or find me on Amazon. My three novels are set in today's world and feature Greek gods who meddle and maneuver as they always have.